God, we continue to pray for friends and loved ones and church family who are going through sickness right now. Lord, every time we even get the common cold, we're reminded that sickness comes because we live in a sinful and fallen and broken world. It's a reminder of our own fallenness. Even passions our prayer, even so come, Lord Jesus, deliver us from the body of this death. Continue to pray for Grace and her family as doctors help her with this cancer issue. Pray that she would help us through the meals ministry and just upholding them with precious promises from your word. Be with those that are traveling, give them travel mercies, give them a sense of mission. Help us to turn our conversations to gospel significance and turn the people to consider Christ. Pray for those with ongoing work and housing needs that you would show yourself as more than sufficient for every detail of life. God, we come this morning in ways heavy hearted over what's going on in our own land and around the globe as evangelical leaders continue to make clear choices to pursue their own self and their sin and hide in the life of shame to disqualify themselves from the ministry. God, give us a sense of soberness that we're not seeking to castigate those that have been unfaithful but to learn from it. If any man thinks he stand, take heed lest he also fall. God, keep us close to you. Help us to own our sin and to be readily involved in confession of sin and repentance and seeking forgiveness at your hands and any others that we offend. God, protect me. Protect area pastors in the Rogue Valley from disqualifying sin. God, we continue to pray for Pastor MacArthur down at Grace Community Church as the lawsuits continue to protect the ministry down there. We know that... Uh, Many times, court cases that happen there affect, has a ripple effect to our ministries all around to the nation. God, would you be so kind as to continue to protect our religious freedom, but if not, give us that persevering grace that we need to suffer wisely and to never turn our back on you. Meet with us now. Use your word to make us more like Christ. We pray in his matchless name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, if you take your Bibles and join me in Mark chapter 8 this morning, I'd like to preach to you the prediction of the passion. And for those that may be new to the church, may be new to Christianity, when we talk about the passion of Christ. We're referring to the last week of Jesus. Mark, even though he squashes down and gives us the Reader's Digest of a lot of the events of the life and ministry of Jesus, you look at how much time he spends towards the end of his epistle or his gospel account and talking about the last week. It's expansive. This is no minor theme. This is why Jesus came. He came to die that we might live. That word passion is from the Latin patior, to suffer, to bear or endure, referring to the very short final period in the earthly life of Jesus. This is Jesus' first death announcement in the Gospel of Mark. As he began to prepare his disciples for that fateful time, don't be mistaken as to why we didn't study verses 31 to 33, our text of today, last week with the connected verses. They are crucially connected. It's evident from the fact Luke didn't even begin a new sentence here in, in Luke's account. So this is the same substance as Peter's confession of Jesus as Messiah. We just understand my own weakness that I can't get through very much of the time. 
and uh, the, the heart and mind can only uh, absorb what the seat can endure, right? And uh, we understand that uh, I have a hard time in the economy of words just drawing out of the, the text. The longer you study it, the deeper and wider it gets. It never gets old. It, all, all of Holy Scripture is pregnant with meaning. So this specific and opening, open teaching regarding the coming cross was a direct sequel to Peter's confession of Jesus as God's anointed Messiah. So we'll read the text, but also the previous context. We, even though our study for today is verses 31 to 33, let's begin our reading in verse 27, where we were last week. Mark 8, beginning verse 27, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questions his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. What does it mean, what Peter confessed, that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, he is the promised king? We understand that we have to have a healthy dose of Daniel, uh, that this is the awaited one. The Old Testament prophets have been talking about ever since Genesis 3.15, the moment man went into sin, there was a promise that the seed of the woman is coming, the Messiah is going to undo as the second Adam what the first Adam brought us into. Jesus now has to explain and fill in the gaping holes about what this truthful confession that Peter gave truly means. And it's an answer that Peter and his associates are ill-prepared for. Christ began his ministry proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. He came to rescue people from their sins. It's, it's no mystery. Saying, I am that great, though benevolent king. He came to die in the sinner's place and take punishment that they deserve for their own rebellion. From the very first verse, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Mark announced Jesus to be the Christ. But until now, he had kept the theme under wraps. This is the first time Jesus speaks plainly about his purpose and mission. By the way, what difference does that cross of Christ make to the way you live? For many people, the answer to that question is a simple, no difference at all. But for believers gathered here and elsewhere on the Lord's Day, we hold that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ is the center of human history. Because on the cross, Jesus died for our sins to secure life beyond death for his followers. And when he rose triumphantly, he, he secured and promised the fact that because he rose, so will we through faith in his name. Amen. There's no greater hope and reality than this. Christians are banking our eternal destiny on the Passion Week. Because Jesus died and rose, we have a certain hope of eternal life with God. Amen? 
So we want to study Jesus' appointment with the cross. Now that he's being very clear, he's plain, so that even the disciples can get it. We want to study it to understand the preordained purpose of God in the crucifixion of his son, especially as he calls us to the same cross. Let's evaluate our hearts and minds for any kind of ignorance before we castigate them for their ignorance, or any kind of opposition to the preordained purposes of God, lest Jesus say of us, as he said of Peter, get behind me. Let's begin with the death announcement. This is the first time in Mark's Gospel where Jesus spells it out in no uncertain terms. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. So when he began to teach, Mark says, marking a, a definite turning point in his ministry of teaching, the grammar asserts the actual commencement of this new teaching as it gets very specific regarding the Passion Week. There's no parable, no mystery, no allegory, no figurative speaking. It re represents a powerful new theme in Mark's story. Death would now be the repeated theme. So he began to teach. Teaching now is it's present, present tense, indicating continuing. This is going to now mark the rest of his specific teaching ministry to the disciples. It's ongoing practice. It brings about the reminder that those of us that teach have been told that repetition is the key to learning, especially for us slow learners. <laughs> Rather than talking about his eventual reign and his victory and his success, now that Peter, for himself and all the other eleven, had articulated the messianic identity, this is the sign of the long-awaited one. And instead of Jesus talking about reign, victory, and success, he talked of his imminent rejection, his suffering, and his death. You know, I, um, those of you that are following uh, uh, Facebook photos of a new grandfather know that I, uh, I'm too quick on my iPhone taking pictures of this cute little guy. And, uh, the expressions on the face when he furrows his brow and everything. And what I'm thinking as I'm, as I'm reading through this, and don't think this is grandpa uh, or pop pop, whatever they call me, um, reading into the text, but you know that that picture of his face is just in my mind as they are for the they're they're hearing this for the first time, and they've got this quizzical look on their face. What are you talking about, Jesus? Never in Israel during the first century was it heard that Messiah should suffer. Doesn't make sense. You know, we understand that there's Isaiah's teaching of the suffering servant, that it, but it long been forgotten at this point. They inherited misinterpretations of very familiar Old Testament passages. Look at me at just a, a, a sampling of what they should have known and what good Jewish schoolboys would know. Back in Psalm 16... Psalm 16 and verse number 10. There's a lot of Messianic Psalms we could turn to. But in Psalm 16, 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. The Jews all knew this was a Messianic Psalm prophesying of what would take place over in Psalm 22. 
and verse number 1. Some words that Jesus would say from Golgotha's cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Down in verses 7 and 8, all who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Psalm 22, 16. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Is it not just going off in your mind all these prophecies that immediately were transpiring and fulfilled in the crucifixion account? Over in Psalm 69. Psalm 69, verse 21. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink as they would offer that sponge to him, that faithful man. Over in Isaiah's account, chapter 40, verse 14. Isaiah 50, in verse number 6. I gave my back to those who strike me, capital M there, right? Speaking of the Christ. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. You're over in in Zechariah. Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, prophesies about the 30 pieces of silver that he would be sold for. But that's not where I'm stopping. I'm running right to Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12, and verse number 10. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Think about this. Now, we've got the completed revelation of God, the progress of revelation. We've got all the details, and we, we understand from the gospel record that they, they missed their Messiah. Right? Did not the Jewish people miss them? And so Zechariah is prophesying that they will look on me, whom they pierce, and they will mourn for him as one mourns from an only child, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over his firstborn. We miss our Messiah. If we have the time, we would spend a good juncture just soaking in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 12. We've read it together before. The suffering servant of Yahweh. There can be no missing that this was God in human flesh. Not in their wildest imagination did the twelve disciples associate suffering and death with their messianic king. Only triumph. But now they're presented with this outlandish idea which staggered them. It's interesting that in response to Peter's confession of Messiah, what 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 did Peter say after after they already said what all the other people, all the crowd was saying? Peter said, "Thou art the Christ." Christ. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't pick up with the identity that Peter confesses. Jesus uses his favorite designation for himself. We're we're going back to. Mark 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Son of Man applied, he applied this to himself more than 80 times in the Gospels. 
designating both his divine messiahship, this is Daniel 7, verse 13, and his hum humanity, this is Philippians 2, the incarnation. Daniel 7, 13 shows that Son of Man is a messianic title that they were well aware of. He probably preferred the term Son of Man because it was clear of any of the political connota connotations and enabled the Lord to associate it with the thought of suffering servant rather than king or messiah with all of its political connotations. Later in Mark 10.45, he clearly connected the thought of his redemptive suffering with this term, the Son of Man. So he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. He asserts the inevitability of those sufferings to come. He must go through it. He must drink the cup of the Father's fury. It cannot pass. From the divine standpoint, there was the Father's will for him. Only through these sufferings could man's redemption be realized. There's no other path. But from a purely human standpoint, his sufferings would be the inevitable result of his rejection by the Jewish leaders. Way back earlier on in Mark's accounting, as the Pharisees and the Herodians uh, talk together, how, we can, how can we destroy him? So he's giving a teaching now to beware of the coming events. And rather than castigate them, rather than oppose this, they need to welcome this. Peter is, after all, going to become the mighty preacher of Acts. And he's going to recognize and proclaim that Jesus was delivered over to be crucified by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Keep your finger here in our in our text, run over there with me. Acts 2. This is that passionate Pentecostal sermon that Peter is preaching. And as he brings out the bony finger of conviction and accuses the Jewish people of what they're guilty of. Acts 2.23. This man, or actually go back to verse 22. Acts 2.22. Men of Israel... Listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. In other words, you guys all saw it, you heard it, you witnessed it all. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, is the one that you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Over in the third chapter, Acts 3, 18. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that this that his Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Here you've got man's responsibility and God's sovereignty in the same verses. God's story is going forward without hiccup. Even though man is culpable for his opposition and putting Jesus on the cross. So in other words, the cross was no accident. This isn't plan B. This is not a good plan gone awry. This is the preordained plan of God. Four particulars as we go back to Mark 8 that Jesus gives us of the Messianic identity. The identity of suffering, the identity of rejection, the identity of death, the identity of resurrection. He says, Lord Ray, I've got to suffer many things. Implies the, the greatness and the diversity of the sufferings, but throws kind of a veil over many of the details. A couple of notes on the many things that he suffered. 
The suffering that Jesus foretold is not like what we find in the Psalms. A lamentable misfortune contrary to God's will. That's what you and I, uh, we, we, we find ourselves many times venting our laments and using lament psalms crying out to God. And when we're asking the questions. Well, this is no mere misfortune. This is nothing opposing God. The way to Jerusalem, the bitter end that awaits Jesus is affirmed as God's ordained way for him. He must suffer. God is therefore precisely God in that he can do what humanity cannot do. God can allow himself to be rejected, to be made low and small without thereby being driven into an inferiority complex. Whoever understands the suffering of the Son of Man understands God. It is there and not in heaven's splendor that one sees the heart of God. Unquote. So that first note that this is God's ordained way for him. And also that suffering and death would come not as we expected. It's not going to come at the hands of the perceived godless and wicked people. Not coming from humanity at their perceived worst, but at its best, so-called. In other words, not the result of a momentary lapse on the part of man or an aberration of human nature. Jesus' death, his sufferings, are coming through careful deliberations from respected religious leaders who will justify their actions by the highest standards of law and morality, even believing them to be rendering service to God. Jesus isn't lynched by an enraged mob or beaten to death in a criminal act, but he's arrested with official warrants. And he is tried and executed by the world's envy of Jewish fruits, the Jewish Sanhedrin. Think of that. So he says, whether I am going to suffer many things, whether I am going to be rejected. Who am I going to be rejected by? The elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. The the the, Aria, the, the religious hoopla of the day. He tells them that he'd be subjected to official examination and like a spurious coin, he disapproved. You see, he didn't, he's not going to meet the Sanhedrin standards for Messiah. The Sanhedrin consisted, first of all, of the elders. That's 70 influential lay leaders to the nation who were members of the court. And you add to the, the 70 lay leaders of the elders, the chief priests. That would include the official high priest and any ex-high priests and leaders of the 24 forces. You know, there were Sadducees, the most influential in the court. In Jesus' day, the chief priests included Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas. So you've got the elders, you've got the chief priests, and what else is in the same even the scribes? Mostly Pharisees. They're the legal experts, the professional interpreters of the Mosaic Law and guardians of rabbinic tradition. If the Sanhedrin, here's what we need to understand. If the Sanhedrin had not persisted in their absolute rejection, Pilate never would have crucified Jesus. And God's plan would have been shelved. These three groups represented the official seat of religious power among the Jews, and God sovereignly used wicked men for his purpose, while they remained guilty and culpable for their acts. He's going to suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the Sanhedrin, letter C. He's going to be killed. Jesus clearly foresaw a violent death. 
The time is left indefinite as to when this would occur. And its mediatorial purpose was not yet mentioned. The innocent for the guilty. A couple of occasional hints that the growing hostility would end in death, we saw back in chapters 2 and 3. Back in chapter 2, Jesus talked about how the bridegroom is going to be taken away, and that's going to be your, the right time for fasting. Because he is going to be taken away. Chapter 3, when the Pharisees and the Herodians began conspiring against Christ on how to destroy him. How did they destroy him? Death. Letter D. There's a fourth component. He always says this. He doesn't just talk about his death every time he mentions I'm going to die. After I die, I will rise. And this additional fact is always included in his announcement. Now they accepted the teaching of resurrection at the end of the age. But the thought of Messiah's death and resurrection was inexplicable to them. In spite of what Jesus says in, in uh, John 2.19, destroy this temple in three days, I'll rise up. This resurrection theology, resurrection in fact, is not peripheral to the story. It's essential. Notice Again, as you get into verse 32, Mark reminds us he was stating the matter plainly. He's putting the cookie jar down on the bottommost shelf so that even the dimwit disciples. <laughs> and uh, as what I try tying in, as we every time we look at them and our, our fingers pointed towards them, we've got three fingers shooting back at us, right? Amen. Slow to learn. This phrase, this little sentence there in verse 32 is recorded in Mark alone. The grammar indicates that this thought is the previous verses. He's repeating. He's enlarging <coughs> as he tried to impress the truth upon the minds of the disciples. That word about stating plainly. Parousia can be translated boldly. He's teaching it confidently. It's used in the Gospel of John to refer to Jesus' bold disclosure of his purpose. It appears only here in the Synoptic Gospels, and ironically, only in connection with impending suffering. What's he making clearer than clear can be? Death and resurrection. He's spoken clear and unambiguous language. These are not veiled illusions as he's done before. In John 16, 25, we, we read about it. He often in his teaching uses figures of speech. There is none of that. There were previous obscure intonations of his death. For example, let me, let me give you a few to think about. <coughs> the statement to the Jews at the first Passover in John 2.19. Then the next chapter in John 3, we know that Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus. And then his remark about the bridegroom being taken away. Mark 2. His words about giving his flesh for the life of the world. Even his reference to the sign of Jonah. It's a, a little bit um, figurative. He explains what Messiah looks like and the results from the disciples' is bewilderment and dismay. So he puts on a level of clarity that even they couldn't guess. So this is the first time in Mark's Gospel that Jesus predicts the Passion. 
in the next chapter, chapter 9, verse 31, and then in chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, will be the next two times. Three main times, Jesus made it very plain. Very plain. There's going to be a multitude of suffering. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. And I'll rise three days later. Stupefying pronouncement. Not that he finally speaks of his messianic status. It's not to claim the common understanding, but to redefine it practically beyond recognition. So we've got the first pronouncement of the Son of Man's death. Notice the response. And Peter. We could just stop right there. Oh, we know exactly what's coming down the pipe. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You know, as Peter took him aside, uh, you know, Peter's scandalized by the announcement. The whole idea being abhorrent, inconsistent with the confession Peter had just given, and in which Jesus had warmly approved. Now, Mark doesn't give us any insight that Jesus approved of the confession. But in Matthew's account, Jesus basically gives him an attaboy. You confess rightly. This is a good confession. Mark doesn't clue us in. All Mark tells us about is, well, we'll, we'll save that for a moment. Peter, like his countrymen, reacted to the offense of the cross. Motivated by his affection for Jesus, you see how affections can be, you know, our, our emotional component can be big liars, screaming at us, and they're not even the real reality. So, when our question is his love, his sincerity, Peter felt it essential to pressure Jesus to eliminate these gloomy forebodings. He was sincere, but sincerely wrong. The picture is him constantly taking, kind of putting his arm on Jesus' shoulder and turning away from the rest of the boys. Turning away from them so as not to draw too much attention <coughs> and to help Jesus save face. He acted in an air of conscious superiority. He forgot his place and put his own selfish desires about the plans and purposes of God. And lest you think I'm reading into this, Matthew gives up, he, Matthew records exactly what Peter says. Peter said, God Forbid it, Lord. Now, Jesus is the one that earlier has told his disciples, zip it. Peter doesn't say it in quite those words, but as he took him aside and he began to rebuke him, it implies that he was cut short by the severe response of Jesus. He kind of settled for the popular stereotype of a triumphant Messiah, not a dying Messiah. So this apostle, with the hoof-shaped mouth, rebukes his Lord. This word, customarily used for rebuking demons, is used. The worst and most ultimate form of evil. It was used back in chapter 4 and verse number 39. When Jesus got up and he's the one that rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And then the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. So the disciples are in the boat Big storm outside the boat. And then they recognize God in the boat because when Jesus rebukes the wind and the wave, it shut up. There wasn't even a ripple. And Peter's trying to use the saying, who's got the authority here? <laughs> and dear disciple of Jesus today, how often 
have you or I and told God he was wrong? In what ways do we oppose God's predetermined plan and purpose when his plan is going on just swimmingly? As was uh, mentioned in uh, one of the prayers during our service today, we love to quote Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. And we're hoping that there's going to be a whole lot more good that's going to be really easy for God to work together for good. But that sovereign promise in Romans 8, 28 is that he will even work bad for good. And remember Job's question, shall we not, shall we accept good and not evil from God? That when we quote Romans 8, 28, we also include Romans 8, 29, we don't know a lot of why God brings the obstacles and difficulties and things that just don't look right. Surely can't be the will of God for me to be sick. And yet Romans 8, 28 shows the context that he's going to use anything and everything to perform Christ, uh, to produce Christ like this in our lives. Whether that be good events or exceedingly horrific and painful and sinful events that the sovereign of <coughs> God will work together for his good and our glory. His glory and our good. His good and our glory. Unless we have heresies and faults. <laughs> so we must move. Does that not illustrate what Peter's doing? We got a wrongful rebuke here. So run to the next verse. The rightful rebuke. But God's always button into the picture here. Turning around, Jesus seeing his disciples, he in turn rebuked Peter, who rebuked him. <laughs> Jesus whirls around to observe the other disciples. They hardly approve their spokesman. His reply is not only going to uh, benefit Peter, it's going to, Peter is the spokesperson for the the disciples. Anytime that they're thinking it and talking it in private, he'll be sure to verbalize it and get taken to the woodshed over it. Yes, this is the apostle of the hoofshaped mouth. And so as he rebukes Jesus, Jesus turns around. His reply, not only helping Peter orient his theology, but the whole entourage. Peter's censure was turned back on himself. Recall Mark does not record Jesus' commendation of what a great job Peter did confessing the rightness of the Messiahship of Jesus. But he does record this censure. Peter, in a way that he cannot know, opposes the deep mystery of God. For suffering is the only way to destroy the stronghold of Satan. Jesus has already declared, this is why I came. The strong man of the house must be bound. And Jesus exerts authority, not just over nature, not just over disease, but over demons. And he rebuked those demons. Send them back. And anything demonic in their behavior or their speech. This was demonic speech. He says, get behind me, Satan. Does that sound familiar? Right before Jesus started his earthly and public ministry, Mark's account of the wilderness temptation, uh, the, the language is very strong. Uh, the Spirit through Jesus that thrust Jesus, the Spirit of God thrust Jesus into the wilderness. He had to go to the temptation to prove in the divine showdown that Satan is on God's leash, and it may seem like a really long leash many times. <laughs> but back in the wilderness experience, Matthew's account, Matthew 4.10, Jesus in all of his authority says, Go, Satan. He dismisses him. Jesus has already intensely recommended the disciples earlier in this chapter. And this is a stronger reprimand showing that there's more danger here 
Possibly more dangerous than obvious error is near truth. Partial truth is more believable. Now notice what Jesus is not saying to Peter. Jesus is not saying identically what he said to Satan. Go, Satan. He did want to bring up the element that you're being a mouthpiece for Satan. You're being a tool, a pawn to do his bidding. He's not commanding Peter to leave, but to get out of the way. He was becoming, in essence, a stumbling block. In Peter's effort to dissuade Jesus from the cross, Jesus recognized a repeat of the wilderness temptation to dissuade him from the path of the cross. Whether it be Satan himself, or all his minions, or even Jesus' followers, anything that impedes his way to the cross is of the wicked one. Peter had made himself an unwitting agent of Satan. Moving immediately from being spokesman for God, thou art the Christ, to being a mouthpiece for him. Jesus isn't identifying Peter as Satan incarnate. He's just an unwitting agent. So he banishes Peter's suggestion of the finality that he used with Satan. Notice what he says. When he says, get behind me, Satan... For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Jesus takes Peter and the disciples to man's miscontrol center, the heart and mind. All the issues of life come from our heart. What was dominating and swaying Peter's thoughts? Because out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What's Peter and the boys been talking about? What they've been dwelling upon, meditating upon? Well, they're not motivated by the things of God. Things related to God's purposes, but the things of men, the concerns of fallible human beings in the worldly system. There's sinful rationale and reasoning, unenlightened logic and passion. Now, I understand that we're on the other side of the cross, not where Peter and the apostles are, but over in Romans 8, Paul fleshes out this line of thinking that Jesus is after as he schools Peter and the other 11. Over in Romans 8, as we not look at the bony finger of accusation of the disciples, let the three fingers point back at us to how our heart tends to work. In Romans 8, verse number 5, those who are, according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind, the inner man, set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it doesn't subject itself to the law of God. For it's not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, Paul says, we're not under obligation not to the, we are under obligation not to the flesh, but according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Take that to this account when Jesus rebukes Peter and thus the rest of the disciples, whose mind is not set on things above it. It's carnal. It's, it's man-centered. 
There's this theology of death and resurrection that they need to learn. When the disciples play God, rather than follow Jesus, they, they inevitably become satanic. Peter's human desire was to spare his master from suffering, and thus avoid the very suffering he's committed himself to as the messianic servant. He's thinking in human terms. When human terms conflict with the things of God, you and I are not being disciples of Jesus, but disciples of the adversary. Jesus was too new and unique. Too big and oddly shaped to fit into his contemporary's traditional vision holes. As Jesus continues to push the envelope and unfold the, his, his glory and his greatness as a dying and rising from the dead Messiah. Yeah, this, this holds true today. You look at modern scholars who tend to make Jesus over into their own image. And in the process, eliminate any eternal claim he might exert on their lives. Some present him as a revolutionary who gathered a band of desperados to bring about a social liberation of the oppressed peasants. You know, Peter and all the gang, what are you going to drive out the Romans? It's all we care about. Others in our day present him as an itinerant, nonviolent teacher spouting pithy maxims. Yet others as a charismatic healer trying to reform Judaism. And all these speculations, dressed in the garb of academic expertise, are no closer to the truth than the best guesses of Jesus' contemporaries. The media often seizes on these opinions. One commentator sagely points out that this kind of media hype can be presented with enthusiasm and does not require radio, newspaper, or TV presenters to take a stance about Jesus' religious claims that might offend viewers, unquote. In many respect, Jesus as an ethical, if impractical teacher whose memorable sayings about turning the other cheek not casting the first stone and loving your neighbor make for absorbing reading. The Jesus Mark presents to you and I, and the church confesses, is not simply a Galilean holy man, a nice teacher, a fervent prophet, a peasant leader, a wandering cynic calling people to live according to common sense and natural law. All opinions opposed by recent scholars on the historical Jesus, we throw out. He's the Son of God. Peter confessed it, and Jesus is filling in the gaping of holes. He's the Messiah whom God sent to suffer and to save his people through death and resurrection. There is no second plan. Not only you know, this, this coming to the cross, they're on the road, they're on the way, as we pointed out last week. This cross is not just for Jesus, though, is it? It's theirs as well. They, too, whom he is speaking, must in their turn follow him on the road to death, and through that death be taken up into glory and triumph. Here's the, the new scenario for the disciples to... Meditate upon and to make their own. Their natural human repugnance in face of what appears to be defeat and disaster needs to give way to the divine logic, which turns human evaluation upside down. The road to Jerusalem is going to be a classroom in which they begin to learn this radical new ideology of the kingdom. No surprise that they're slow learners. And that even by the end of the road, when they finally get to the cross, they're still not prepared for.
But the theme has loudly been trumpeted at the outset, and discipleship is never going to be the same again. Jesus' wisdom that he's bringing to the disciples for them to think about, it just doesn't make sense to them. You know, one of the applications I think of this last week in Bill McCumson class, we were looking at the body and soul dynamic. Modern man in, in uh, mainstream medicine sees a body. We can drug it, we can cut it. But when we are illuminated by divine logic, Revelation of God that teaches that man is a living soul housed in a body of flesh. That's a different worldview. That the greatest good <coughs> may not be healing from disease, but the glory of God. Even if it means no healing. John 8, 1 to 4. People ask the question. Who sinned, this man or his parents that he's born blind? Jesus says you got both answers wrong. He's born blind for the glory of God. Peter's vision is fuzzy here. And he's speaking for fuzzy-minded disciples. They and we need to understand God's plan to supersede and transcend human reasoning. Paul, in trying to massage this this theology into the Corinthians in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, the word of the cross, it's foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the very power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I'll, I'll set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Man's reasoning, you cannot reason yourself into the Christian faith. Falls apart. For Peter... That the Son of Man will die is unthinkable, but for Jesus it's inevitable. Death is the means to glory. Peter gravely failed at Caesarea Philippi, but he's finally going to get it. The bad news is in spiritual reality exceedingly good news. When Peter begins to pen his first epistle, And get it right in 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust. So that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Peter, you find that. <laughs> You'll go, go back to the second chapter. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin, there's our death, and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. What the disciples saw as ultimate bad news that day was the best news the world ever received. Peter, set your minds on things above, not on things below. Peter get it. 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. The question for us, dear friends, is has Jesus become precious to you? Much later in Mark's gospel account, Mark chapter 12, Verses 10 and 11. Jesus said, have you not read this scripture? Aren't you aware that the stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone? This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the people. You know, the religious leaders, we got to kill him. 
They rejected him. Comes to the territory. Do not continue in rejection. Come to him today as the precious lamb of glory who slays sinners. Bow to him in repentant faith and worship. God, we thank you for Christ. Thank you for the ongoing glimpses and details that he begins filling in for those disciples that we might better appreciate and savor Christ. Might he become more precious in our affections, make us greater lovers of Jesus as we continue to sojourn with him in the gospel of Mark. Increase our love for him and our love for our neighbor, loving others as he has loved us. For Christ's sake we ask it.